عالم الله 
Begin by praising Allah, the one God. Uh, we praise Him, we seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. Uh, and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah, whoever God guides, no one can misguide, and whoever God leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that God alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. First of all, I would like to profoundly apologize for not being able to speak to you in Norwegian. Uh, it sounds a very nice language, um, but... Uh, Yes, English is pretty much my limitation. Um, so I'm sure most of you, I'm sure assured that most of you understand English. You probably understand English better than most English people, and you probably speak it better than most English people as well. Uh, but uh, inshallah, I will try uh, to make my words uh, as understandable as possible. Um, okay, my plan for today is since um, the Imam was not able to make it. Uh, my plan today is to try and combine some aspects of his talk with the main topic that I've been asked to talk about, which is the uh, does God exist? And his talk was going to be about the purpose of life. But I do think that those two topics, from our perspective as Muslims, they come together very well. Now, actually, I want to start by asking you... <laughs> I want to start by asking you some questions, and I'll probably be doing this throughout the evening just to make sure you're still awake uh, and that you do understand what I'm saying. So uh, my first question really is very fundamental to what we are going to be talking about over the next two days. And I think you will find, inshallah, that between today and tomorrow you'll find a lot of continuity uh, between what I'm going to talk about today and the topics that I'm going to be covering tomorrow. But the things that I want to, the, the issues I want to discuss are um, God. What is a God? And from that also I want to talk about what is religion. Yeah? So my first question to you is what is a God? Can anyone please define for me a God. What is a God? Yeah, hands up who's a university student, please. <laughs> oh my God. Huh? Come on, hands up. University students, hands up. Is that it? Really? Huh? 
Okay, I don't know. In Norway, in Norway, let me, tell, let me ask you a question. In Norway, do you just sit and the teacher just talks to you and you just sit? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> oh my God. I thought you had the most advanced education system in the world, you know? Probably it's advanced because you went back to the old school ways of doing things. But anyway, please, I would like a definition. What is a God? Please, come on. Some brave person, at least start off. What is a God? The creator. Okay, a God is the creator. Let me ask you a question then. You know the Greeks believed in a pantheon of gods. Yeah? So did they believe that Apollo was the creator? Did they believe Apollo was the creator? Or how about Aphrodite? Did they should believe she was the creator? But she was a god or a goddess, right? And Apollo was a god. Yeah? The same with Hinduism. Do they believe Ganesh is the creator? No, but he's still a god for the Hindus. Yeah? So now, I'm, now you get my point. So I'm not asking what is the god. I'm asking what is a god? What is a god? Yeah. Independent, and uh, he's totally unique from the creation. Okay, let me ask you a question. Let's apply that to Apollo. Do you as a Muslim believe Apollo exists? Even? No, not as a god. Okay, but even as, a, as any real type of being? So, okay, but the point is, does your criterion your criteria apply yeah. to Apollo or Ganesh or Kali or I don't know? Yes. Okay, something you worship. A god is something that you worship. Let's ask another question. Why do people worship gods? Why? Why do people worship gods? Why do people worship anything? Yeah. Yes, sister. To seek guidance. Okay, that's good. What else? Huh? Huh? Hope. That's good. I like that. Anything else? Yes, sister. Uh, why do you worship God? Yeah, why do you worship? No. Why do people worship things? Why do they worship gods? Personally, I worship Allah Yeah. He gave me something. He gave me the body. Okay. He gave me my eyes. Okay. My talk and everything. Yeah. And for example, if I lose my eyes. Yeah. And I'm trying to see all the world, I will not buy the same eye that Allah SWT gave Okay. So, okay, you're worshipping, but I'm just, you're worshipping the Creator out of gratitude, that's fine. But I'm trying to get to something much more basic than that. So we have gods. We, there are things that people worship, and why do they worship them? Someone said hope, someone, yeah. People seek utility. Okay, they seek utility. Okay, let me put this, that's very complicated English. <laughs> I'm not sure, I, does anyone understand that? <laughs> Okay, let's put that in simple English. <clears throat> in simple English, yeah, the reason why people worship a God is because they think that God is going to give them what they want and what they need. Yeah? And in many religions, there are different gods for different things. Yeah? So, for example, if you are a warrior people, like the old Norwegians, yeah? We learnt in history how, you know, the Vikings came and raided our shores in England. <laughs> Very naughty. <clears throat> you see? The Viking Mujahideen, I think. was. <laughs> <laughs> so, we all, we, we all have our pasts, you see. So, I don't even, I can't even remember but what I was talking about now. But, yes, so, okay. No, actually, in Norwegian history, yes, in, De in Scandinavian history, you have actually Valhalla, right? Valhalla is a place where the Vikings go to continue fighting. This is, they love fighting so much that heaven is a place where they fight and die and get born again and fight and die. And, you know, and that's, I don't get that, but, you know. Um, the point is they have many gods, gods of war. So if you want to win the war... You pray to the God of war. Because why? You believe that this God will give you what you want. Yeah? 
So you have gods of rain, gods of sun, gods of the crops, gods of fertility gods. Yeah? If you want a child, you worship this god. If you want something else, you worship that god. And the reason people worship these gods is because they believe that by worshipping them, they will get what they want and they will get what they need. Yeah? So this is a god. But let's extend this idea. This may be a bit revolutionary to think like this, but I want to extend this idea. I want to extend it, extend it from the point of view of what we could call the Islamic philosophy. Yeah? The way Islam sees and views things. If your God, if your God, if a God is worshipped because people believe it will give them what they want and what they need, then from another angle, whatever you believe is going to give you what you want and is, give, is going to give you what you need, that is your God. Yeah? Whatever you believe is going to, is going to give you what you want and is going to give you what you need, that is your God. And what is religion then? Religion is the set of rituals and belief system that is connected to the worship of that God or those gods. It could be formal, it could be informal, but this in a sense is the religion. It is this, how do I, how do I worship this particular God? Well, I will make this sacrifice, I will say this prayer, I will do this dance, whatever, you know. <laughs> and by doing that, you know, I will please the God and the God will give me or she will give me what I want and what I need. <coughs> okay. But let's extend this idea. Let's extend this further. And let's think therefore about what something the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, وسلم, he said. He said, woe. Woe means like misery and disaster. Okay, this is what it means. Woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Woe be, misery is for the one who worships the dinar and the, the dinar and dirham is the money in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we translate that. Okay. Woe be to the worshipper of the dollar, the pound, the yen, the krona. Yeah. Woe be to the worshipper of money. Now let me ask you a question. Yeah. I don't have any money. Who's got some money? Some. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Can I have some Norwegian money, please? Good, I get some at last, you know. No, I need some notes, yeah. Who's this lady here? MashaAllah. I think, I, I don't know, is it bad? I think I'm going to show you, show you this. Okay, so, woe be to the worshipper of money. Okay, does that mean, oh great krona. Please, is this what it means, worshipping money? Does it mean that? No. doesn't mean that. The one who worships money... <laughs> the, the worshipper of the money does not mean the person is praying to the money, literally, and worshipping it. Yeah? No, what it means is, woe be to the one who thinks that money is going to give them what they want and what they need in life. You put your trust in money, you put your hope in money, you put your faith in money, you think that money is going to buy you what you want and what you need and money is going to make you happy in life. You are the worshipper of money and money is your God. Yes? This is also therefore a God. It's also an idol. It's something that people worship. Why? Because they put their faith in it, they put their trust in it, they believe that this thing is going to give them what they want and give them what they need. We can go on. Yeah? Fame, beauty, yeah? Uh, beautiful clothes, belonging to a particular part of society. I came myself from a, what we can call, I don't know, I don't know if in Norway you have classes. Do you have like upper class and middle class and 
No? You're not you're a classless society here? <laughs> My hotels, do you still have a king or a queen or anything like that here? Yes. Yeah, you do. Yeah, so you have aristocracy and same thing. Okay. So in UK as well still, we have a class, you know, a society of classes. And I came from something what you could call, generally call, the upper middle class. The upper middle class. Yeah? So my school, I went to a public school, which is a bit confusing in, in English, yeah? When we say public school, we actually mean a private school. <laughs> yeah? So if you ever hear say, someone say, I went to public school, they went to private school, okay? I, in England. It's one of those funny things, okay? So I went to private school. Uh, I was brought up in a, you know, upper middle class family. My father, and I will tell you more about this in my story, about, you know, how I became Muslim. Uh, but he was sent to Egypt when I was about 10 years old, uh, and, you know, to set up Barclays Bank in Egypt. Anyway, the point being is that at the same time, my school was a Roman Catholic monastic boarding school. Now... At home, we were taught certain manners, certain etiquettes, okay? And they had very rigid rules that we had to follow. And these rules included rules how to eat, how to drink, many things. I remember one of the great rituals of the British upper middle class is the dinner party. And I don't know if you've ever, any of you have seen that film, Titanic. Yeah. Oh. What, sorry? It's all those good Muslims, okay? And, <laughs> and uh, okay, I've seen it too, okay? And, and, and when, I don't remember the character's name, but you know, when Leonardo DiCaprio is sitting at the, you know, he goes to the, you know, the upper class place and he sees this array, yeah, of spoons. You remember that? Knives and forks and spoons and he sits there like, my God, what am I supposed to do with this? And the lady says, don't worry, just start from the outside and work in. Yeah? And really, that's what it's like. We had different glasses for different drinks. A red wine glass, a white wine glass, a water glass, a liqueur glass, different knives, different forks, different spoons. Each one has a different function. And you need to know these important functions of these important utensils. There is even a special way to butter your bread roll. So just in case, you need to know one day, I will tell you the right way to butter your bread roll. Okay? Now the right way to butter your bread roll is you take your bread roll and you put it on your side plate. Then you take a bit of butter, and I don't know if you can distinguish British accents, yeah? You take a bit of butter as opposed to take a bit of butter, <laughs> right? You don't want to talk like that, right? You take a bit of butter and you take it with the butter knife that belongs to the butter dish. Have you got that? And then you put the butter on the edge of your plate with the butter knife that belongs to the butter dish and then you return that butter knife to that butter dish. And then you take your own personal butter knife and you know that's your butter knife because it's the smallest knife, is the butter knife, right? And then you break your bread roll on the plate. Woe betide the one who breaks their bread roll up in the air. <laughs> no, you, you break it on the plate and you keep it. And then you take your piece of butter with your own butter knife and you spread it. That's, and, and the same people, the same people sit around the table saying, Oh, we're not really religious in our family. Not really religious. But isn't that a type of religious ritual? It is, if you understand that it's all connected to the belief that if we belong or you belong to this class of society, it is a doorway to success and happiness in life. And so all of these rituals are connected with that. Right? So, what I'm doing is I'm trying to deconstruct in your mind the narrow parameters that have already been constructed for you by your society. I'm doing something very dangerous, right? And in reality, if you want to know why people think Muslims are dangerous, okay, it's nothing to do with terrorism, it's nothing to do with jihad or these type of things. 
It's to do with the reality is that you have been socialized. You have been conditioned. You have been brainwashed by your society to think in a certain way, to react in a certain way, and to invest your energy, your mental, your psychic energy, towards certain goals that the society has defined for you. And the dangerous thing that I'm doing tonight is I'm trying to divert you. I'm quite open about it. I want you to divert your energy from that to something else. Now that doesn't mean I want to create a chaotic society. No, I don't. I just believe that there are goals that are more worthwhile you investing your time and your energy in than the goals that the society has set up for you. Because the goals the society that has set up for us, by and large, I don't think Norway is different from Sweden, which is different from England, which is any different from the US of A. We have all one thing in common in these societies. Okay? The West, what is called the West. One thing that we have in common is that we are consumer societies. It's a society that is based upon the idea, the ideology. I would like to call it, please, now with my new definition I've given you, the religion, okay, the religion of consumerism. And the God that you are worshipping is the God of money and material success. So what your society tells you is that by having money, by having things that the money can buy, by being materialistically prosperous, through these things and by these things, you will be happy. And this is the definition the society gives you, by and large, of success. This is the religion of the West. It's not Judeo-Christian. It's a materialistic, consumer society that is orientated around making you and indoctrinating you to be producers and to be consumers in that society. And this is what I'm here for two days to challenge those ideas. Now you can call it and give it different phrases you like. You can call it an ideological warfare. You can call it a philosophical discourse. I suppose it depends upon how important these things are to you. Right? I am sure a lot of you here, by the way, are going to agree with a lot of things that I say anyway. You probably know already that what I'm saying is true. And what I'm saying to you is that the God of materialism, the consumer society, it is a false God and it is a false religion. It is a false God and it is a false religion. And this is the purpose that you have been given in your life. You have been given this purpose. And your society, the media especially, the media essentially is controlled by the interests of who? You tell me, there's another question I'm asking just to make sure you're paying attention, right? The media, the mass media, in general, the TV, the newspapers, the magazines you read, the TVs you watch, how do they make their money? How do they make their money? The huh? Adver 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 advertisement. <laughs> Got me confused. Advertisements. Yeah? Okay, through advertising. Yes? Is that true or not? Okay, what do they advertise? Tell me some products advertised in newspapers and magazines. Yeah? Huh? Cars. Huh? Come on, guys. Girls. Cars. Oh, cars, houses, property, clothes, makeup, makeup huh? drinks. Huh? Okay, you get the idea, right? <laughs> you might not be so indoctrinated after all I was thinking. So, yes. So their interest, these advertisers, their interest is for you to buy their product. Right? If you don't buy their product then that's a problem for them. That means the media is largely driven by the needs of advertisers. And therefore there is a symbiotic relationship. That's a nice big word in English. Symbiotic. 
Okay, but you get by my expression what it means. There's a symbiotic relationship between the advertising and therefore the, the people who produce those things and the media. Their interests are together. So by and large, the media is going to reflect the interests of multinational corporations and big business. That's what it's going to reflect, by and large. That's very important that you think about that. Because I'm going to ask you another question now. Don't you think that every human being has some idea of this is what we think is right and this is what we think is wrong? We think this is good, we think this is evil. We think this is acceptable behavior and we think this is unacceptable behavior. Yes? True? Doesn't everyone have some concepts of that? Yeah? It seems like, for example, 80% of Norwegians seem to think it's unacceptable behavior for a Muslim woman to wear hijab if she wants to be a policewoman in Norway. <laughs> yeah? Yes? I, I've got to ask you a question. What is the basis? Where did you get this information from? Where did you get this piece of knowledge from? That this is allowed and this is not allowed. This is acceptable and this is not acceptable. This is the right way to behave and this is the wrong way to behave. Where did you get this information from? Huh? Yeah, well I mean, who's the first people that start teaching you these things? Right? Your parents. Then you go to school. Right? Then school, they teach you and your friends, your peer group. Yeah? Your peer group. Your friends. They influence you in the way you think. And of course, the media, okay? I think it's important to realize that who is trying to control the way you think and the way you behave? Who is controlling what you think is right and what is wrong? And don't you notice another thing? The, the, the goalposts of what is moral and immoral, what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, are constantly changing? Yes? Something that was really not so good 50 years ago, is suddenly okay today. Why? What made it not good then, and it's okay now? I mean, I'm not going to give you the answer. <laughs> I want you to think about it. Okay, it's very important. Because most people don't think about these things. But it comes back to religion in the broadest sense. Right? What we would call in Islam, deen. You see, we don't, I don't think we have a word exactly religion. The Qur'an uses the term deen, which I suppose you could translate as a way of living, a way of life. So everybody has a deen. Everyone has a way of living. Everyone has a way of life. Everyone has a set of standards by which they account themselves and they account others. Right? So let's go back to our consumer society. Let's go back to what I am claiming is a false idol. Now you may say, Abdurrahim, you know, come on. Look at our society. Look at the wealth. We are happy. Look at, we are materialistically successful. We've overcome so many diseases. We've overcome so much poverty. We live happy, comfortable, prosperous lives. We live longer than we ever have before. If you want the evidence of our success, it's right here. Look at it. And it's true. From one angle, I have to admit that. You know, I am not an outright uh, critic of every single thing about Western society. Absolutely not. There's too many things actually to admire and respect. But what I want to do is examine the core aspects here. I want to examine the core aspects. Now, I have to apologize, I don't know much about Norway, okay? I don't know much about life here, I don't know much about the problems that you have here, or maybe you don't have any problems, okay? <laughs> it's quite possible, okay? We had so many amazing things about Scandinavians, you know? Um, but in England, believe me, and in America, I'm sure you will recognize there are too many problems. Too many problems. And so, what I want to get us to think about is what we are being sold, what we are being told, the consumer society. You see? So, 
Okay, 10 minutes. Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> just as I'm getting warmed up, you know. Um, let's look at some of the advertisements. Yeah? You ever see those advertisements for Coca Cola? Yeah? You see in the Coca Cola adverts, some of them, right? What do you have? You have young girls, it must be, you know, Swedish or. Norwegian girls, I'm sure, and boys as well, they're most good looking, definitely, okay? And they're there drinking coca and smiling and <laughs> laughing and, you know, the, the water spraying and the sun shining and they're, they're brown, not Pakistani brown, but, you know, <coughs> yeah, you know, nice Caucasian tanned brown, yeah, okay? And, you know, and, and these, these individuals, you know, they're not like me. <laughs> All right, you know, trim and slim, and you look at that, and you're sitting there, and you say, man, I want some of that. <laughs> I want some of that. And so what do you do? You go out and buy Coca-Cola. <laughs> now let me ask you a Coca-Cola, let me ask you a question. Does Coca-Cola make you slim and young and give you shiny white teeth? <laughs> Does it? Two bottles of that over there. Let's see who's drinking it. <laughs> and by the way, this is for Muslims. I'm not saying Coca-Cola is haram. Yeah? Okay? I'm just trying to point out, here is the reality. And the reality is what? The reality is what? In America, obesity. Obesity is such a major problem. And in UK as well. Obesity is much, uh, such a major problem amongst the youth that they are saying that for the first time a generation of kids are going to die before their parents. The single most major culprit are fizzy, carbonated, sugar-loaded drinks. The single most major culprit are sugar-loaded, carbonated drinks. More than anything else. Right? Also, saturated fat, high salt f food, yeah? But now they're thinking of banning these advertisements. But what is Coca-Cola? You know, Coca-Cola symbolizes it. Coca-Cola symbolizes this whole consumer society. You know it's what it's called? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's it. It is. Because if you want a phrase that summarizes the whole attitude, sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's it. You know what? You don't want to believe in this God and this paradise that's in the life to come, pie in the sky. If you want to have fun, you need to have fun right now. This is the time to have fun, right? We had the atheists in England, now they're putting advertisements on the, on the buses. There's probably not a God, so just enjoy your life right now, <laughs> right? And you know, it ties in so nicely, doesn't it, with the materialistic religion. It ties in so nicely. Buy this car, have this. And look, if you look at the advertisements, I'm sure it's not any different. What are they selling? Are they selling you a product? Do they list the qualities? Our car has this efficiency, the engine. I mean, sometimes they do, but most of the time, you know what they're selling you? They're selling you an emotion. They're, it's emotional appeal. They want you to buy based upon emotion, right? As I was saying to one brother today, why do you buy a Mercedes? Why have you got a Mercedes? I'm sure you've got a Mercedes because you know what? Not because the Mercedes is the better car than the Toyota, whatever it is. The Toyota is probably, it's probably more efficient. It's probably more reliable. It probably produces less CO2 gases. It's probably actually, if you did a blind test, more comfortable, right? But you drive a Mercedes, why? Because of what it says about you. Why? And why do you think that? Because that's the image, the idea that has been put into your head. You've been indoctrinated. You've been brainwashed. But that's about everything. You know? That's what you think success is. My life is miserable. Let me have a, ho a holiday. Let me go shopping. Shopping therapy, they call it. <laughs> shopping therapy. And now we have the biggest depression that's hit the world since the 1930s. What is the reason? Because people are spending too much and getting into too much debt and too much. And what do they tell us to do? The solution is go out and spend more. <laughs> spend your way out of... It's madness. And oh, we haven't even mentioned, by the way, 
what's happening to our planet in the process. Right? Oh, we, oh, we forgot that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we forgot the fact that we are polluting the atmospheres, destroying the ozone layer, causing huge amounts of carbon emissions. We, have so, we generate so much rubbish, we don't even know where to bury it. Right? We waste so much, and we're still not happy. We still consume more. More and more and more. What, you see the question is, does it really make you happy? Does all of this stuff really make you happy? This is the question. Is it really true, the equation, wealth equals happiness? Is it really true? This is the question I'm asking you. And my claim is no. Think about it. I want you to think about something else, okay? And forgive me, I'm going to go on just a little bit into our prayer time. It's okay, we can delay it a bit. You know, I remember seeing a, po a documentary uh, on the TV in UK, uh, and it was about raves. Do you remember raves? Anyone heard about raves? There was this phenomenon in UK. Basically, what used to happen is people would start phoning each other, and basically, they'd have a big, basically, it came down to having a big party in a field, right? And they'd bring their sound system, and everyone would come, and they would literally dance all night. I mean, you know, I'm a 1970s boy, John, Tra John Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, <laughs> you know, discos, and that type of stuff. And, you know, we used to sort of wind down like, you know, three, four, five in the morning. These guys, seven, eight, nine in the morning, still bum, 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 <laughs> right? And they're still going. And, they're still and this guy, they're interviewing this guy, and he is totally drenched in sweat. And they're interviewing him and they're saying, why do you do this? Okay, and you know what his reply is? He said, I have a miserable life. A miserable job, a miserable life, and I come here in the weekend and I dance and I dance and I dance until I forget myself. Until I forget myself. We have a problem in the UK. We have a problem with young girls drinking too much alcohol, binge drinking. It's going to be a health crisis because their livers are going to pack up. I remember reading in the newspapers, why are you drinking? You know what they said? Our life is so boring. Our life is so boring, so miserable. The only thing that gives us a bit of relief is unabated hedonism. Hedonism means just indulging sex, drink, well, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's the only thing that gives us a bit of relief. Now, does that sound like happy people? Does that sound like happy people? It doesn't sound like people who are happy. It sounds like people who are actually desperately sad, but need something to fill that void and that emptiness. And look at the words we describe. I was stoned, right? I was stoned. I got wasted. Wasted, stoned. I was on cloud nine, yeah? I was, excuse me, pissed as a newt, okay? Um, university. I don't know if you have this here, right? Any Muslim saying he might be puzzled by this. You know, four o'clock in the morning, people tumble into the room, bleh, they puke up, right? And they fall asleep in a, in a pool of their own sick, and they wake up the next morning, and they say, man, I had such a good time last night. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what happened? So, I don't remember. <laughs> you mean... The less I remember, the more of a good time I had. That doesn't sound like people who are happy. It doesn't sound like people who are happy. What I'm saying is there is something missing. There is something wrong, something fundamentally wrong. Money does not equal happiness. Wealth does not equal success. You are being sold a lie. You are worshipping a false god. The question I'm putting to you here is if... If wealth and so-called material success is not the purpose of life, and you know what? I'm pretty sure deep down inside everyone in this room knows that is not the purpose of life. That is not the reason for your existence. I know you've been asking yourself, why am I here? I know you've been asking yourself, what is it all for? I know you've been asking yourself, where did I come from? Where am I going to? But you're not finding answers. Okay? I hope 
that by the end of tonight, I'm going to give you some answers that make some type of sense, have some type of logical consistency, and important, importantly as well, appeal to what I believe is an inner state of knowledge that we all have. Okay? Anyway, the point is now that we Muslims, we have to go and pray. We won't be too long. Yeah? Inshallah. So we're going to come back. Please don't disappear. Because uh, I'm excited about finishing this talk. So thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Okay. Question time for you. Uh, hands up who can give me the answer. Okay. This, w w what's this called? In English, please. What's it in Norwegian? See? Uh, er, er. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Er, er. So this is called er, yeah. And what what does the what's the er for? What's it for? Huh? To listen, yeah. To hear and to listen. Well done. Give yourself a round of applause. Yeah. Come on. Uh, okay. Next question. This. What's that called? Nessa. I love Norwegians. <laughs> Nessa. Okay. And what, what's the Nessa for? Huh? Actually, you know the ear, by the way. The ears. What, you know, it's for hearing. What else does the ear? It's a very valuable thing. Balance. Balance. Well done. Yeah. Okay. The nose is for smelling. And what do we call these? Uh, Norwegian, please. I want to learn some. Huh? Uh, uh, uh. Oina, Oina, Oina. It's a bit like Arabic, is it? Ain, isn't it? Oina. Okay. And subhanAllah, you can almost find a link between all the languages, you know. But okay. And so, what are eyes for? See. Okay. How about these? Yeah. Huh? Teneth. Teneth. What's that for? Uh, biting, eating, chewing. Okay. Um, okay. Who is, oh, who, ah, uh, brother, what's that on your face there? Yeah, here, these things. Look. Yeah, what? Brilled. Uh, huh? Brilled. Brilled? Brilled. Huh? Brilled. Yeah. Oh, brilled. I'm not even going to try and say missed off. No, I'm not even going to try and say. Okay, and what do they do, bro? What what do they do? Those glasses of there's brilere, yeah, brilere. I can't. Anyway, I'll have to write it down. What 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 are they for? They make me see. They help you see better. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, sis. Yeah. Pen. In Norwegian, please. Pen. I'm going to be fluent in Norwegian. And what does it do? What is it pen for? Yeah? Writes. Okay. What's the point of all of this? Think about everything. Think about your body. Think about every single constituent part of your body. It has a purpose. Even your appendix, which they used to think has no purpose. Actually, they found it has a purpose. They found after they've chopped out thousands of appendix, they found it has a purpose. Everything you have, your lungs, your heart, your kidney, your eyes, your nose, your feet, and even the externalities, your glasses, your pen, everything has a purpose. It has a reason. It has a purpose. Now let's think about this. Is it really conceivable that every single constituent part of your body, every bit of your body, has a purpose. The sun has a purpose, the moon, the stars, the sea, the grass, even the worm in the earth has a purpose to fertilize the soil. But you, the whole of you, what is your purpose? Huh? Is it possible that each thing, everything has a purpose, but the human being does not have a purpose? It's, it's not something we can accept. It doesn't make sense. 
And so when you ask people, what is the purpose of your life? Sometimes people, they misunderstand the question. They, what they understand by that is, what do you want to do with your life? Yeah? So then they say, oh, well, you know, my purpose in life is to become a doctor or an engineer or, you know, my purpose in life is, you know, my girlfriend here, you know? And isn't that nice, you know? And so the purpose in life is your girlfriend until she runs off with one of those guys from the Coca-Cola advert. <laughs> Remember them? Yeah? And then it's like, <laughs> what's it all for? Because you just realize that that can't be the purpose of life. You thought your business was the purpose of life until you became bankrupt in the credit crunch. So what's the purpose of my life? You thought the purpose of your life was what you wanted to achieve, you know, in your exams, and, but you fail your exams. And many people, I'm sorry, it's very sad, you know, they feel despair. In fact, it's so bad, people kill themselves. They commit suicide. They commit suicide because they feel that everything that what they thought their life was about, it's proved to be nothing. So I'm not asking, what do you want to do with your life? I'm saying, why do human beings exist? We know why ants exist, why birds exist, why the sun exists. We know what the pen is for, the pen. We know why it exists. But the human being? Uh, what is the purpose of our existence? Now, I'm going to get back to the in-between stage because there's an in-between stage and I'm going to jump over that in-between stage and I'm going to get back to it. And I want to jump ahead without going through all the bits and pieces and I want to jump ahead to answering this question. Okay? But before I will answer the question, I want to... I want us to think about some analogies, okay? Now, does anyone have a mobile phone with an aerial on it? You know those mobile, remember the mobile phones used to have little aerials on them? Do you remember? Or are you too young for that, okay? <coughs> okay. Huh? Let me borrow your mobile phone, brother. You give me money, you give me a phone. Very hospitable, the people in Norway, okay? So, we have a mobile phone, okay? Now, how much, how much did this cost? Without contract, you buy it straight. How much is it going to cost you? I don't know. About now or when I... Yeah. <laughs> Can someone give me a more advanced mobile phone. It's just a, ooh, this one. I want an expensive one. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. iPhone. All right, sister. That's what I like. Okay. So we've got the iPhone. Now I know that, that that's not cheap. Yeah? So I go down to the marketplace and I buy myself an iPhone. Right? And what do I do? I use it. <laughs> yeah. I bought myself <laughs> I bought myself a nice armpit scratcher. Yeah? And I use the mobile phone. I spent six hundred pounds or how many Kronos, yeah? Kronos? Yeah? How much? Six thousand. Six thousand <laughs> kroners to scratch my arms. Right? I, I, you know, there's a reason I'm mentioning this. Jazakallah. Okay? Don't watch that now, you know, that's... You eBay it. You know, Abdurrahim scratched his armpit. <laughs> there's a reason, there's a reason why. Because I know some of you today, maybe you're thinking, look, you know, it's all very nice to talk about, you know, the materialistic society, and, but, you know, I'm enjoying my life. You know, I have, it has use, it has benefit, right? And my comparison is most people's life is like taking a 6,000 kroner mobile phone and using it to scratch your arms, your armpit, right? Yeah, you can give some use to it, you can give some use to your life, but is this really what you have been created for? And unlike a mobile phone, you are not an inanimate object. 
Okay, there is much more complexity to the human being. Okay. So that mobile phone. I spent 6,000 kroners to scratch my armpit. Most of us would agree, this person is a fool. I mean, either you're too mu you've got too much money, right? And too little sense, right? Or you really are a fool. I mean, that's a waste. That's a really criminal waste. Okay? And another thing I want to think about, okay? When I get my shiny, nice new iPhone, and I know most of us, we have a familiarity with technology and so on and so forth. But I remember when I first got my first mobile phone. Actually, for many years, I refused to have a mobile phone. But anyway, my friend, he gave me his one and he kept insisting, I can't contact you and this and eventually I gave in and he gave me his mobile phone. Now, I had never used a mobile phone before, right? And so he gave me the phone, but there's something he didn't give me with a phone that would have been really useful. Huh? What is that? Oh, the charger, he gave me the charger, okay. <laughs> what else? SIM card. Yeah, the SIM card, I had a SIM card. Okay, the instruction manual. I mean, I admit, the most basic function, I could make a phone call. But I, I know the phone had about 20, 30 different functions that I never, ever learned how to use. Right? Because I never had the instruction manual. I never had the instruction manual. Now that phone, I don't remember, let's say it was made by Nokia. Yeah? Now let's try, I want to get an instruction manual. And let's say I get an instruction manual by Sony Ericsson. Is that any good for me? Okay. I've got a Nokia phone. I've got a particular model of a Nokia phone. What do I want? I want the, the, I want the instruction manual from the, the manufacturer, right? I want the one who made the phone to give me the instruction manual on how to run that phone. If I want to know how to use it, what's it for, what is its features, what is its functions, I need the instruction manual from the one who made the phone. And I hope that you're getting my analogy. If you want to know what is the purpose of your life, if you want to know the reason for which you exist, if you want to know how to live your life in the best possible way, according to the reason for which you are created, okay, I don't need instructions from Freud, Lenin, Marx, Descartes, Aristotle, Plato, Believe me, they all need instruction manuals themselves. <laughs> right? I want the instruction manual from the one who made me. I want the instruction manual and I want the guidance from the one who created me and brought me into existence. Because everything else is really just guesswork. Everything else is conjecture. What they call in Arabic, dhan. Speculation, guesswork, conjecture. If I want to know what is the reason for my existence, if I want to know what is the purpose for which and by which I exist, the only one who can really inform me of that is the one who gave me existence, who created me, and who made me. Now, I'm going to go back to the mobile phone. Because I tell you what, right? I could give a long, the brother who invited me, I said, you know, I'm going to change the topics a bit and mix, mix the purpose of life with does God exist. He said, but your does God exist talk is, you know, it's one hour, 45 minutes. I said, that, you know, that's another talk. You know, this is, a, you know, everything we, you know, horses for courses, we say, you know, no problem. So I said, okay. This is coming to the question. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through all the different philosophical arguments, right? that discuss as to whether God exists or not. <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to present to you what I think is the most effective argument. Can I prove to you that there's a God? Intellectually, rationally, to be frank, I don't think I can prove it. Right? But what I do believe I can do is illustrate why believing in the existence of a transcendent creator, meaning believing in the existence of a God who is different and separate and unique. So he is distinct from, or the Creator is distinct from the creation, is the most rational and sensible explanation for the existence of our universe, our world, and ourselves. 
And to illustrate the point, I'm going to go back to the mobile phone. I'm going to go back to the mobile phone. Now, here we have a simpler mobile phone. Sorry, brother. <laughs> and um, although I don't know the brother, I'm going to speculate now as to where he got this mobile phone from. Okay? He was walking... Now, first of all, let's just, I just want to think about something. What are the essential components of this phone? The materials it's made out of? The casing's made out of? Plastic. Plastic. Yeah. And inside there's a little chip. Yeah. <coughs> there's a little chip. Yeah. We call it, what do we call it? A silicon chip. What's silicon? Silicon is? Sand. Plastic comes from? Oil. Okay, name me a place where there's lots of oil and sand. Huh? Actually, Iraq is better. There's so, you know the oil in Iraq, they say you put, a, in the areas where there's oil, you put a straw in the ground and oil comes out. It's the most easy oil to extract in the world. Okay? So, the brother was visiting Iraq. I'm not trying to put you in trouble, brother. Okay? <laughs> and <coughs> innocently, he was visiting Iraq, he was walking along, and there he found on the ground the mobile phone. A product of millions of years of chance and coincidence. You see, the oil bubbled, the sand blew, the lightning struck, the sun shone, the camel trod. <laughs> and after millions of years of random events, this phone randomly formed itself by chance and coincidence into the mobile phone that we have here today. He picked it up, pressed the button, and he called his mum. Okay? Now, you know, I'm sure we all agree that that is preposterous. And in fact, you might say, what do you say? Well, how preposterous is it? Right? Is it because I said a million years? Okay, how about a billion? Does it make it less preposterous if I say a billion years? How about two billion years? Well, how about, let's take what? Um, what Obama's giving 875 billion, yeah, to bail out the banks. Let's add, how about 875 billion years? Do you still think you might get a mobile phone? Maybe? Maybe someone might say, yeah, maybe. Right? And that, this is the thing, you see. What the atheist is asking us to believe is something actually more incredible than that. More incredible. Because the most basic living cell is much more complex than this mobile phone. Yet they are still trying to make us believe, and I don't care how many billions of years you want to put it, that that is a product of merely some random events. In fact, if we look at the universe itself, if we look at the mechanisms through which and by which the universe exists and continues to exist, they are even more complicated and complex than the biological processes that exist on our earth. I am telling you that the claim that this universe is a product of random events, it's a product of chance and coincidence, is not a rational claim at all. In fact, the most rational claim is that when we see things working according to laws, according to systems, according to patterns, when we see mechanisms, our human experience, our common sense, our common human experience tells us that if I find a mobile phone, if I find something working according to mechanisms and patterns, it could be something even more simple than a mobile phone, a pen. In fact, it could be more simple than that. I could be an archaeologist digging in the desert and I find a simple piece of pottery. And for me, that piece of pottery is conclusive proof of the civilization that brought it into existence. I don't need to see that civilization. I don't need to see them. I don't need to see those people. But the existence of that is proof of the intelligence that brought it. In fact, I can examine it and tell you many things about that civilization just by examining one piece of pottery, which is a lot less complicated than a mobile phone. So the most powerful argument, in my opinion, for the existence of a creator 
is the existence of an organized, systemized universe in which we live. And there are other arguments, but this to me is clearly the most powerful and the most profound one and the most rational one. And the proposition that it is a product of chance and coincidence to me is merely that, a proposition. That's all it remains. Now there are some, some people who are dedicated atheists and they literally dedicate their lives simply. All they're trying to do is make the proposition less likely. That's all they can do. Because fundamentally, human beings, intellectually, rationally, and by the way, by our very instinctual selves as well. I mean, I believe it's a basic instinct. We believe that this universe has a creator. All the atheist can do is try and show how it is less likely and how it might be possible through some processes that these things may have happened through some random events. All, all it ultimately comes down to is a proposition. Because if you look at that rationally, and by the way, they, they mention this concerning biological processes, right? And they successfully managed to convince some people. But when you come to the laws through which and by which the universe is governed, it's a totally different kettle of fish. Right? It's a totally different proposition. It's very, very hard. The most physicists, astrophysicists, they will admit that the idea that this is some random event is it, very hard to accept. Okay? So, they try to show that, oh, in some ways it might be less likely. And if you just look at those arguments, most people would not be persuaded. Okay, they would not be persuaded to believe there is not a God. Because an atheist believes there is not a God. Not someone who doesn't know, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, I don't know. No, an atheist says there isn't a God, and, I, and that's what I believe. Right? And what do you find? Is the argument of the atheist, let's go back, is an emotional argument. Most of their most powerful arguments are not rational arguments. They are emotional arguments. There is so much suffering in the world. Children are dying. There are earthquakes. There is disease. How can there be a God? Yeah, sound familiar? All wars have been caused by religion. Okay. First World War, Second World War, Pol Pot, Stalin, okay, not much religion there, but except if you accept our definition of religion, right? But put that aside, you know, okay, but, you know, I mean, but let's go back. All wars are caused by religion. It's, is this, and I want to ask you, is this really a rational argument? What has this got to do with the existence of an organized, systemized universe and planet in which we live? Absolutely nothing. All it questions is theological discussions about the nature of God. But it doesn't tell us as to whether there is a creator or not. So what actually what they're saying is, how can there be a good God? How can your Christian God, your Muslim God, your whatever, right? But actually it's got nothing to do with the fundamental question as to whether there is a creator who exists that has brought this universe into existence. It, but it's an emotional argument. And most people, like we are indoctrinated to be socialized into this system, similarly, by the way, it's a materialistic society. A materialistic society, it's in its self-interest as a materialistic society to make you or to persuade you not to believe in a creator. To invest your time, your energy, your effort into this world. And that's why, and it's not my intention by the way, to outrightly dismiss the theory of evolution. But the theory of evolution is a major theological, and I use this term on purpose, theological backbone of the materialistic society. And let's go back. Why? Because basically the theory of evolution is saying that human beings are basically sophisticated monkeys. That's what it's saying. Yeah? I know evolution doesn't say that we evolved from apes. I know that evolution says that we and apes are supposed to have evolved 
from common primates. But the point being is if we reduce it, basically we are just animals, sophisticated animals, but we are essentially monkeys, sophisticated monkeys, right? And that's it. There's nothing more to us. There's no deeper purpose. So it's very simple, right? How do you make a monkey happy? <laughs> yeah? It's very simple. Give monkey banana. <laughs> right? Monkey's happy. Yeah? Give man monkey, woman monkey. <laughs> you got a happy monkey. Right? And keep the monkey safe, right? From, you know, the dangerous things. And what have you got? You've got a happy monkey. How do you keep human monkey happy? Same thing, right? We give you some food, we give you some clothes, we let you have lots of sex, right? If man monkey doesn't like woman monkey, okay, man monkey, man monkey, woman monkey, woman monkey. <laughs> it's okay, it's all your animal passions, right? It's just your basic, your basic animal passions, right? Just do it, yeah? Just. Follow your desires, follow because that's it, all you are. What is it? You don't need to be lumbered down by these taboos and, because basically you're just an animal. A slightly sophisticated one, but that's it. So that links up very nicely with the whole consumer philosophy. If you think science is merely some dispassionate examination of the facts, you need to think again. You need to see some of the scientific evidence produced in the Soviet Union. Right? Who outrightly dismissed any theory, any scientific theory that indicated that there may be some intelligent being that created this universe was written off. It didn't matter how, what, it didn't actually matter what the data was. The fact that it suggested an ideological viewpoint contrary to their own was dismissed. Right? Similarly, there is a lot of scientific research done by alcohol companies, tobacco companies, right? How much of the medicine that we consume is produced under so-called scientific conditions, but it's all biased. Biased based upon a system of medicine that makes you buy the medicine. It doesn't, it's not based upon curing you, no. In fact, it's in the, it's in the interests of these multinational medical companies for you to be ill because as long as you're ill you'll keep taking their pills right so you, scientific research right scientists are just as open to ideological influences as anybody else right now it's not my intention to say evolution is true or not it's just a fact that there is a very convenient connection between that theory and this Okay, and it goes back, and this is what I go back to. What I would say is really in reality, the most convincing explanation for an organized, systemized universe is the existence of an intelligent, wise being that has brought it into existence. Now I know there are many questions that go on from that. I, I propose just now to answer some of those questions, right? But in order to do that, I just need to develop a few ideas, okay? Let's agree, for the sake, just for the sake of this discussion, that yes, the universe works according to laws, it works according to systems, it's very difficult, and I could go into some details of those things. We could talk, let's just briefly mention some things like the alternation of the night and the day. It's very interesting, the earth spinning on its axis once every 24 hours. I want you to imagine the Earth spins very, very slowly on its axis. Instead of it spinning on its axis one every 20, once every 24 hours, imagine it spins on its axis once every 30 years. So imagine one part of the Earth's surface is exposed to the sun for 30 years, and one part of the Earth's surface is, ex is absent from sun for 30 years, right? And in astronomical terms, that's not a big difference, right? But what would that effect, effect do you think that would have on life on this planet? Yeah? What do you think? Do you think life would exist? Well, not the way it does, right? Almost definitely. What if the Earth was closer to the Sun? 
Or what if it was further away from the sun? We have other planets we can see. The result. What if the, it was bigger or smaller? The gravitational effect. How about the com composition of gases in the atmosphere? Oxygen, essential for, for life. Too much oxygen actually poisons life. You need carbon dioxide, you need nitrogen, you need a fine balance. And how about that fantastic gas, the ozone? How about that? That has this amazing quality of filtering out the harmful effects of the sun's radiation. What if that wasn't there? We'd all be nuked by the sun's radiation, right? I mean, what an amazing balance, an amazingly fine balance. You know, if you compared the earth, if you shrunk the earth to the size of a snooker, a billiards ball, you know, billiards ball, right? The earth is smoother. And this is just concerning some things. If we actually started to go into the whole way the universe is constructed, it becomes even more amazing. So we have a question. The question is, how did it happen like that? There must be some intelligence behind it. There must be some creative power behind it. But this question leads us to ask something about the nature of the universe and this being, or these beings, because it may not be one being. We accept that. Okay? So let's ask the question. Did the universe create itself? Hmm? I, I, I'm asking a question. Do you ever get something coming from nothing? You don't. You don't. That's our universal human experience. You don't find something coming from nothing. It didn't create itself. It didn't come from nothing. And we're not the creators of it. So the universe must have a creator. Now, one thing we can presume logically, rationally, is the nature of the creator must be different from the nature of the creation. Why? I'll tell you why. The reason is because if the nature of the creator is the same as the creation, then, well, that's not the creator. That's just more creation. And then we still ask the question, well, who created that then? And you've probably heard this question. If everything needs a creator, who created the creator? Yeah? You heard that one? Yeah? yeah? It's actually another silly argument, right? It's actually another silly argument. And the person who asked that question doesn't understand the nature of what we're discussing. And I'll tell you why. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm simply going to illustrate this with an example. Say you see this platform here. Okay, I want to lift it, right? Oh, I can't do it, okay? Need some of that Coca-Cola, right? So uh, I can't do it, so I asked someone to help me. Can you come and help me lift the thing? He said, sure, but only on the condition that someone else comes and helps me. Right? And he says, yeah, yeah, I will help you, but if only if someone else comes and helps me. And he says, yeah, sure. Do you get my point? So if everyone will only help if someone else helps, what will happen to this plinth? Yeah? Huh? It's going to stay where it is. It will never get lifted. Yeah? Let's just use that analogy and go back to our universe. If you have creator creating the creator, creating a creator, creating a creator, right, forever and ever, what happens? You never get anything created. You don't get the creation, right? That's why logically we can presume that a limited, finite, temporary universe must be created by a being whose nature is different. So if the nature of the universe is that it is limited and temporary and finite, then the nature of the Creator must be that the Creator must be infinite, self-sufficient, and eternal. Right? And that is how logically, rationally, we can understand that the Creator of the universe must be an eternal, self-sufficient, an infinite Creator. In other words, a transcendent being. Something that is different from the creation. And obviously you can understand that the question who created the creator doesn't apply to an eternal infinite being. It's a non-question. It doesn't mean anything when applied to that being. Right? Now, can we presume, is it, does it make any logical sense? 
that there are two infinite beings? No. Two infinite, self-sufficient, eternal beings? I think for obvious reasons we can say that that doesn't make any sense. And that's why we conclude rationally. It's a rational conclusion of the rational mind that there is one eternal, self-sufficient being that has brought this universe into existence. It's something that makes complete rational sense. It is not an irrational belief. It's quite the opposite. It is quite rational. It makes a lot of sense. It's the other arguments we have to examine whether they make any sense or not. And by and large, this is what most human beings believe. But what human beings generally have done is that they have taken some things within the creation and they have attributed to them some of the qualities, some of the attributes, some of the knowledge, some of the power that actually only belongs to God. They have taken them as gods besides God. They have worshipped them. They have deified them. They imagine that they have the power. They imagine that they have the strength, the capability that only indeed the Creator has. Now, that is one rational proof that we can use in order to show rationally that there is a one transcendent God. And actually, I challenge you to find me a religion that teaches a concept of God like that, except Islam. That doesn't compromise it. Now, you may say Christianity, but I'm sorry Christianity doesn't fit the bill. For one simple reason. Christianity claims that Jesus is God. And Jesus ate food. He breathed air. He was born. He died. Meaning, he was finite, needy, and limited. Something by definition can't be finite and be infinite at the same time. Something can't be needy and be self-sufficient at the same time. Something can't be temporary and eternal at the same time. That is the very definition of impossibility. It's not a paradox, it's an impossibility. You can never prove an impossibility. You can believe it if you want. You can believe an impossibility if you want. But then on what basis can you justify believing in such a thing? And by the way, that goes for any religion that claims a human being is God. Or any religion that says the universe is God. Then, okay, bring me your proof, your argument. Based upon what do you say that? So the point is that the rational mind will conclude this. This is what the Qur'an teaches about God. This is what Islam teaches about God. Essentially, this is exactly what the Qur'an teaches about the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, there's something else I want to get to. Because I don't believe that the rational argument on its own is a conclusive proof. But I think it's pretty much conclusive. But I don't think it's absolutely conclusive. I think you need to combine that with some other things. And there's two other things you need to combine it with. One I'm going to talk about right now, and the other I'm going to be touching upon it tomorrow. Okay? The first thing, but what I want to talk about today, and this is what I, where, where I want to finish and we'll go to question and answers, um, is another type of proof, another type of evidence. Now let me ask you again to think about something, right? Imagine this is red hot. Yeah? Red hot. Yeah? If I give it to you, brother, right, and it's red hot, yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, you see, here's the difference. Is this hot or not? No, it's not hot. He's just whatever. And, but if it's really red hot, what's he going to do? Yeah? Huh? He's going to drop it, right? Does he have to think about it? Do you have to think about it? It's a reflex action, right? Now, wouldn't you agree that that reflex action is still knowledge, it's still information, isn't it? It is still information, is it not? Right? But where did that information come from? You don't think about it. You didn't analyze it. You don't think, oh, I need to... It's something that happens. It's information that you are programmed with. Right? And I believe, and Muslims generally believe, that you have a re an inbuilt reflex response towards God, to the Creator, the one God. Just like 
when something's hot, you drop it and you don't think about it. There are certain incidents that will happen in your life and what you will do, your reflex action will be to call upon God. Now when I say call upon God, it's not the name here. You may say, oh Jesus, right? But if you said, oh Jesus, or you say, oh Buddha, right? You don't actually mean Jesus or Buddha. Because believe, if Jesus was standing next to you and that thing happened, you wouldn't be turning him and say, Jesus, help me, right? <laughs> you wouldn't, right? You would be calling on the same being that Jesus himself would be calling upon, right? Because it's just the name that has been programmed into your head, but it's the concept. The concept, the being that you call upon, is that being that you know has power and control over everything in this universe. You instinctively know that there is a being that has the ability to rescue you from your predicament. And the Qur'an gives an example. It gives the example of people on a boat. They're on the boat and the waves are coming in the sea and the waves that you can imagine crashing over this boat. The waves are like the roof of a tent crashing down. And the people know the captain is not going to save us. Right? The boat, meaning our technology, is not going to save us. Right? So everything, they, they know their money is not going to save them. They know their Norwegian passport is not going to help them. <laughs> Right? They know looking beautiful and you know my slim body, that's not gonna help you either. Right? And your kroners, they're soaking wet, they ain't gonna help you. There's no way you're gonna buy yourself out of this one. You mean every single thing that you thought was gonna give you what you want and what you need, now you know that it's all worth nothing. All the gods that you worshipped, all the idols in which you put your faith and your trust whether they're idols of money, power, wealth, or whether they're idols, sticks and stones that you actually pray to, similarly. If you pray to those bits of wood and sticks and stone and you thought that this thing was going to help you, you know now, right, that the idol is going to sink along with you. It ain't going to help you. But there is something you know instinctively in yourself, a being that has power over everything in this universe, and that is the being that you call out to. That is the being, that is the creator, that is the one that you know in the depths of your own being has that power and ability and you say, oh God, oh this being, you call upon this being to help you and to rescue you, right? This is your instinct. It's built and hardwired into every single one of you. That is why, la ikraha fid deen. There's no compulsion in religion. I don't need to compel you to be Muslim, it's not even my job to guide you. I am just here to remind you of what you already know. You already know. You already know that you have a creator. You already know that there is a being that has control over you and everything in your life. And you recognize it in your life. But the question is, like so many of us, right? When God does rescue us, <laughs> you know what? People are going to... People ask me, have you been to, a lot of people said, have you been to Oslo before? I said, okay, I'll tell you what happened. A couple of years ago, I went to Ore. Did I say it right? Ore, the ski resort in Sweden. Yeah? I was there and we went with a group of Muslims. Okay? And one girl, she fell over, knocked her head. She got, got flown to a hospital in Norway and we had to drive and pick her up. And then we drove from that hospital all the way down Norway to Stockholm and I passed Oslo on the way. So I saw some buildings. And said, I've seen Oslo now, you know. Now I can die, you know. <laughs> Not quite Venice, actually, but uh, it's nice, lovely city. But what am I getting to? Yes, one of the girls with us, <laughs> poor thing, she'd only just started skiing. And, you know, as she's skiing along and she's doing okay, she saw these kids just like zooming over this slope, right? She said, okay, that must be easy, little kids, you know, I'll just follow them, right? And she found herself on a black slope, right? And she's a green slope skier, you know, green sort of easy blue. And she was telling us, right, she was so scared, she was crying, all right? And what she was saying, oh God, please save me, please help me, please, please, I will be a good Muslim, I will pray five times a day, please God, save me, save me, save me. And she was admitting this to us, right? All the promises she made to God. And you know, she got down to the bottom. And did she start praying? Did she start being... No. Okay, so isn't that... A, that's the human being, right? You know, God shows you his signs. He shows you. 
You make your promises. You make your pledges. You devote yourself to complete and utter devotion to God. But then God saves you. And what you go back to, all the things that you used to worship before. Now that's what most people do. Right? But the reality is that is a proof against you. What happened to you? So there are many different levels of proof that we can offer. Okay? And the final one that I want to offer is to do with experience. Right? But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to be talking about that a bit tomorrow, inshallah, on my lecture about how I became Muslim on my journey to Islam. Everybody, I hope that we've all learned something today. I've learned some Norwegian. It's fantastic. And I hope you've learned some things as well. It's been a real pleasure. You've been fantastic. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about uh, what Islam says about the evolution theory mm. about uh, animals and people have changed. For example, that dinosaur existed. Yeah. Okay, brothers and sisters, um, I don't. I could, you know, I could actually easily give a whole lecture on this. Okay, um, but obviously we don't have time. So very, very briefly. I want to say something to the Muslims, actually, first in regards to the theory of evolution. You know, I don't think it does us any credit, and it won't help you, to simply mock and make fun of the theory of evolution. I personally believe that the theory of evolution is a very powerful idea, and it's powerful because it's simple, and it does seem to explain some phenomena that we see, and that can be observed, in the world in which we live and in the fossil record and so on and so forth, right? Do Muslims believe in evolution? Well, I wouldn't say that it's a point of, certainly it's not a point of view or a, a, it's not a principle of our religion that we have to believe in the theory of evolution, right? Certainly not. So do we believe it in the sense that it's a dogmatic thing that we have to believe in? Certainly not, right? However, Muslims by and large do believe that the scientific methodology, as a methodology, is a good and sound methodology. Okay? And that if science conclusively proves something to be true, that is not something as Muslims we can ignore. Now, Muslims, many Muslims today would still argue that the theory of evolution is not conclusive. There are still many holes and discrepancies that have not been dealt with concerning this theory and there is lack of evidence in order to fully say that we can really be sure that this theory has taken place. However, in spite of that, by and large, we could say that there is nothing that contradicts the idea that creatures could have or have evolved through small stages into the complex different organisms that we find in the world today. There's nothing in principle that says we can't believe in that. Okay? In fact, the Quran teaches us how the human being is developed through stages of embryonic development. And those stages are different. Okay, so the stage of Nutfa is different from the stage of Alaq, which is dif different from the stage of Mudra, okay, which is different from the state in which we finally look like a human being. So Allah, in a sense, has developed us through distinct stages in our mother's wombs. So the idea of development through different distinct stages is not an impossibility. In fact, it's a reality that the Qur'an acknowledges in human embryonic development. So how about this idea applying to life in general? Well, it's certainly a possibility. However, I make a proviso. There are two things that we will say we cannot agree with. As Muslims, we can't believe that these are these processes are completely devoid from 
and separate from the power and the guidance of God. So if evolution has taken place, it's because God is the evolver. God is the one who is evolving the creation. In other words, we can't accept the premise that these are purely natural processes that don't have anything to do with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of the Creator. So, do we believe they are, it's that got really randomly things evolved? No, we can't accept that. Secondly, I stick to the, although there are other opinions, but I don't agree with them, I stick to the orthodox opinion that God has created the human being miraculously. That Adam was created in a way that is miraculous, just as Jesus was created in a way that was miraculous. Jesus was created without a father. No father. God created Jesus miraculously in the womb of Mary, and God just needs to say be, and something is. So, Jesus was human. He was a human being. We don't believe that because God created him miraculously without a father, therefore God was his father. No. Okay? No, that doesn't follow. God just created Jesus without a father. Okay? Similarly, God created Adam without a mother or a father. Distinct from whatever processes were going on in the world at that time, God introduced Adam into the order of the world in a miraculous way. So do we believe that human beings descended along with monkeys from a common primate? No, I don't believe that Islam can accept that and I stick with the orthodox position. Does that mean that there could not have been human-like creatures existing? That is certainly possible. Why not? Because what makes us different actually as humans, there are some differences, but the most fundamental difference is that we, what makes us different from the animals is that we have the choice to submit to God or not. That's what makes us different. Not just some physiological things, right? Whether I have, you know, I don't know how my arms are or my legs are or my nose is or whatever. No, my fundamental thing that makes me human and that makes me different from the animals is that I can choose to submit to God or not. I can choose to believe in and obey and worship the Creator or not. That's what makes us different. Yeah? So I do believe, as the Quran teaches, and that's how I literally understand it, that God created Adam miraculously and God created Eve from Adam. Okay? But does that mean that evolution uh, did not take place? Or no, it doesn't. Islam does not have anything to say about that definitively, one way or the other. So it's certainly possible. So I hope that answers that question and Allah knows best. Okay, heaven versus hell, believers versus non-believers. If God loves all humans equal, why do Muslims say that only believers get a seat besides Allah in paradise? Okay, you see, I think, I would think, I'm guessing, that the person who wrote this question is either a Christian or used to be a Christian, right? Because a Muslim would not say that, right? Unless it's a Muslim who knows more about Christianity than Islam, right? Um, Man, that there's a lot like that. Because there's nowhere that Allah says in the Quran that God loves all human beings equally. It doesn't say that. Okay? Um, and this is actually, the Quran says the opposite. Allah loves the people who are good and who are obedient to Him and who are sincere to Him, you know? So Allah loves the sincere, the mukhlisun, right? The sincere people, right? And Allah clearly says, Okay, inna Allah la yuhibbul kafirun, muflihun, you know, whatever the, you know, uh, the transgressors, the sinners, the, you know, they have choices. Shall I take this way or do I take that way? Shall I obey God? Shall I disobey God? So based upon those choices, right, this is, the cho this is how God makes judgment. But the opportunity, right, God is going to judge us all justly. God is completely just. Right? And God will judge us according to the opportunities we had and the decisions that we made. We may have different opportunities, but still, we made those choices and based upon those choices, Allah is going to judge us. 
Now, some of us may be less intelligent than others. Some may be, but that's not what's important to God. Not how we dress, not how we, you know, when I, when I, when I say not how we dress, I mean, okay, not walking around naked or not, okay? <laughs> I mean whether we have designer clothes. Or, so the point being is that ultimately we have, you know, we have choices that we have to make, okay? Uh, and, you know, God is going to judge us based upon those choices that we make. I want to make a very important point as well, brothers and sisters. The other important point, is that, you know, it's not for you or for me to judge people, right? Okay? Well, I mean, in a way we do. If I see someone doing something evil, right, selling drugs or stealing or raping, of course I make a judgment, yeah? That's a wrong thing and that person should be stopped and that person should be punished, right? But what I'm saying is we can't look into the hearts. We look at what people do on the outside, but we can't look into the hearts, right? You may not know. That the person you're looking at and you're condemning may be better than you. They may be a better person than you, right? They may have more sincerity. Maybe they don't know what you know. Maybe they don't understand. Maybe they have some problems in their life that you can't possibly even. So what I'm saying is, brothers and sisters, you know, we should not be judgmental. Even about people who are not Muslim. It's not that simple just to be judgmental about them, right? You're not the one to say, this one's in the hellfire, that one's in the paradise, this one. No. Allah, alhamdulillah, Allah didn't even, you know, it's not us to do that. Yeah? So we shouldn't have that. This is a very dangerous type of attitude to have. It's, and it's quite easy to fall into that type of mentality. Right? So, you know, we shouldn't have that attitude. Our attitude should be of compassion, of care, of kindness, of concern, you know. We believe that Allah has given us a guidance as to what is right and what is wrong. So we should try to guide ourselves and others in the best way that we can to what we believe is right and away from what is wrong, right? But we shouldn't be judgmental about people, right? Okay, so this is something I really ask you please to, you know, subhanAllah, one scholar, one wise man, he said, blessed is the person who is so busy looking at his or her own faults that they don't have time to notice the faults in others. Yeah, it's a very beautiful saying. But the point is, let's not be judgmental, inshallah. Let's try and find the good in people. And if we see something bad, let's try and change it in the best way, inshallah. Okay, Salam. Can you explain about La ilaha illallah? Yes, really. La ilaha illallah really is the acknowledgement that we do not worship. Okay, which means we do not make dua, which means, sorry, we do not supplicate or pray to anyone else other than God. So our prayer is for God, our worship is for God, our deeds that we do, the deeds that we do, the good deeds that we do, we do it sincerely, seeking God's pleasure. And we try to do it according to the way that God has taught us. Yeah? So we have to be sincere and we have to do things according to... So, we, yeah, we pray to God, but not any way I feel like praying. We pray the way God has taught us to pray. Right? So essentially, La ilaha illallah means that you accept there is one God, one creator of the heavens and the earth. God is not like anything in this universe and nothing in this universe is like God. And we worship God alone. And we try to make our life and our religion sincerely and purely for Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's very, very simply and short what La ilaha illallah means. <laughs>